and we decided to choose three posters. Um, you vote for what you think were the best poster. We also had our own vote separately, and we then did the final decision. Um, so congratulations to the three winners. And we start with the first one, who is Gemma, with the poster on Thinking Outside the BB Box. <laughs> and Gemma is going to give five minutes like spotlight. Yeah, please come here. On the poster. I don't like it. Okay. Okay. Well, hi everyone. I'm Gemma. I'm a PhD student in University of Surrey, and yeah, I'm gonna present this work that I did in collaboration with Adobe in an internship, and it's gonna be presented in ECCB if anyone's there. Um, so basically, the idea is doing object compositing. Object compositing means taking a background image and an object and generating an image that incorporates this object into the background. This involves many different steps, like um, generating shadows, reflections, reposing the object, etc. And many of the state-of-the-art models do this based on a mask. So you need to provide the background, the object, and also a mask, and they constrain the generation inside this mask. So they basically do like an in-painting problem. This has several issues, like for example, if the mask is not completely accurate, if it's a little too big, or a little too small, or a little displaced, you can see that the result is not very natural. Another issue is that since they are only synthesizing inside this mask, if the image requires a long shadow or a long reflection or anything that um, goes beyond this mask, it's not possible. And finally, since the input the, the, the model sees is the masked background and not actually the entire background, the pixels inside that mask um, will not be recovered and it might not be very faithful. So what we propose is introducing a novel task that's called unconstrained image compositing. Um, and we pro propose a diffusion model based, a diffusion based model, sorry, for um, solving this task. So what we want to get is a model that with a bounding box or with a bounding box or without any bounding box can generate images that are um, look realistic, that have long shadow, long reflections, we want the bounding box to be a little flexible, so if it's not perfectly accurate, the model should be able to, um, to correct it. And, and yeah, here you can see a few applications. And so the, the pipeline, just a little quickly, is based on stable diffusion. So we take as input a bounding box, an optional mask, and an object. And our input are the generated image and a, and a mask of the object. So for the input mask, I said it's optional because we, so 50% of the training, we um, use the ground truth bounding box and perturb it a little bit. So we change the scale, we move it around a little bit. So the model doesn't learn a one-to-one -one correspondence. And um, the other 50% of the time, we just input an empty mask. So the model learns to generate um, images without a bounding box as well. And for the object, we encode it using um, an encoder that's basically clip and a little adapter to adapt the, the output of that encoder to something that the network will understand. And um, we, and we um, pro provide it to the unit through cross-attention. So we noticed that the encoder was a scale dependent. So what we do is compute um, this, encoder in, this encoding in several uh, scales and then just averaging to get rid of that bias. And so another important step is the data generation, so the data we use for training. One of the reasons most models are based on masks is that it is very easy to obtain uh, data for training because you just take any image, mask out the object, and um, train the model to regenerate that object. But in our case, we want to give the entire background, so what we do is we uh, we um, generate, well, we create this pipeline that you take any image, segment the object, get the mask of the shadow and the reflection using a shadow detection method and some heuristics, and then we do in painting for obtaining the clean background. Since doing diffusion based in painting, we saw that um, it led to generation of new objects, like hallucinated new objects. If you cover a, a flower and then give it that image, it will generally generate a new flower, and that's something we don't want. 
So what we did was a double step in painting. So we first did in painting using a gun based method that the quality, the output of the quality, the quality of the output is not, um, is not amazing, but it will never generate a new object. And then we refine that using a diffusion based model. And so here you can see some, some results. So if we don't provide any bounding box, it will take the object and repose it and place it in several um, locations and scales that make sense and look good. And yeah, that can be used as a final image or as just a suggestion of how to creatively compose that. And here you can see some examples of, well, the, the last column is ours, um, of generating, providing these um, compositions using a mask. And as you can see, compared to the other methods, we, um, we observe, observe some advantages, like for example, if the bounding box is misaligned, like on the first row, the, the, the dog wears the hat, while in the other models it was not possible. Another benefit, like I was saying before, is the shadows and reflections look way more natural. And finally, our model preserves the background way better than the other ones because the model actually sees the entire image. And yeah, just very quickly mentioned that for evaluation, we compared separately to mass-based um, compositing models and to object placement prediction models, which are models that you uh, give it the background and the object you want to compose. And the output is a bounding box of, um, of a possible um, location where to put the object or uh, a, a scale well, or a mask or something. And you, well, I don't know if you can see much here, but we compare using quantitative uh, metrics and also user studies and it showed that we outperformed or performed comparatively to most of them. And yeah, that's basically it. I don't know how much time I have, but if you're more interested, you can scan the code or contact me, or I don't know if we can get questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. The second poster is Florian. With the power of noise and the final retrieval for the energy system. Okay. So, hello, everybody. My name is Florin Kugonazu, and I'm a first year PhD student at Sapiens University of Rome. And now I'll be presenting our work done in collaboration with a fantastic group of people from Technology Innovation Institute and uh, University of Pisa, which is entitled The Power of Noise, Redefining Retrieval for Rack Systems. So why redefining retrieval? I would say that in, current, in the current years, there has been a sort of paradigm shift in how users interact with uh, uh, retrieval systems. So let's think about uh, a search engine. You have a user, it inputs a, a, a query, and then usually uh, it gets back, it gets back uh, some documents. Uh, the user has to look into these documents and uh, find its answer. Now I would say that with the introduction of large language models or generative models in general, these, uh, this step of looking into documents has been skipped because uh, it may happen that the, 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 the answer is directly generated by an LLM. In a broader terms, I would say that due to this uh, new framework called Retrieval Augmented Generation. So I will go super quickly about uh, RAG. Um, sorry. Um, and uh, I would, uh, the, the focus of this work is to find the role of retrievers in RAG. The research question is the following. So are car retrievers ideal for RAG systems? And uh, again, sorry, uh, I go really quick about uh, RAG. So we have a knowledge base, so our data, personal data, up-to-date information. We, we have an indexing phase where, given this data, we uh, organize them into documents. And um, uh, one of the main actors is the, the retriever in the retrieval phase that upon a query, it uh, search into this knowledge base, some documents, according to some similarity matrix. Um, and then we can build the prompt, so the input of, uh, of the generator, of the LLM, and it outputs back uh, the answer. Now, um, again, to this question, how we tackle this question? We starting looking at the type of documents a retriever can fetch, 
So given a query, we classify three types of documents that are the following. Relevant documents that are the one that has a high score by the retriever and that contains the answer. Then destructing documents are highly scored by the retriever but don't contain the answer. If the query is about the Napoleon's horse, a destructing document could be talking about Napoleon's wife horse. And then we have completely unrelated information that we call random documents. Now with these documents, we can build the input of an LLM, so the prompt. We have a task instruction, what the LLM should output. We have the context that is composed of these documents. And lastly, we put the, the question. Now, if in the documents, uh, in the context, we have destructing documents, we may expect that the generator can be fooled by this other information and, for instance, gets uh, an erroneous output. Let's see what happens in practice with real large language models. So these are the results for Lama 2 7B chat, the instruct version. Here we have three settings that, is, that are about the position of the goal document, the one containing the answer, with respect to the query. In the far, the goal document is placed far apart from the query, and the middle we have, in this case, destructing documents. In the mid, the goal document is placed in the middle of the context, and the near, we have destructing documents, the goal document, the one containing the answer, and lastly, the, the query. So as we expect, so this, this is the result with only the gold document. So you, you give it the, the query and the, one contain, the, goal, the document containing the answer. These are the results. So when we start adding uh, destructing documents, what happens is essentially th there is a, a, a degradation. The worst scenario is the mid one, where we have a 68% degradation in accuracy, which is really a lot. The near is uh, the best configuration in this case, since the degradation is only 33%. Um, and so it means that um, um, LLMs really struggle to attend to relevant information when destructing information are present. Now, let's see what happens when instead of destructing information, we place completely unrelated information, what we call random documents, okay? We may expect that it, uh, it get robust, robust to it. So maybe there is a slightly degradation, but not so much. So let's see. Here we have, if you look at the mid, uh, scenario, we have a deg degradation, it is less, it's not 68. But now, something surprising happens. When we have in the prompt the random documents, completely unrelated information, the gold document, the one containing the answer, and lastly the query, instead of having a degradation, there is an increase. So this is completely surprising to me, and uh, it's really strange. In this case, we manually crafted the prompt. So I know that there is a gold document. I put it near to the query and so on, and I had random documents. Let's see what happens instead in RAG, uh, in practice, sorry, uh, in practice in RAG. So I have my retrieved documents, and I place them into the context. So here we have uh, uh, from one to 10 retrieved documents over the, the horizontal, uh, say, axis. And uh, this is what happens when you place it one retrieve documents up to 10, okay? Now, let's see what happens when adding random documents as before. So again, there is an increase, and in this case is even better. We have a 35 increase in the best scenario where we have 15 random documents, four retrieve documents, and then the query. Getting back to the original question, so are current retrievers ideal for RAG? I would say that the answer probably is maybe not. So I would like to conclude with one thing. When uh, in our retrieval system, like search engine, we have the end user that is a human usually. And as a human is able to understand if uh, among the retrieved documents, there is a relevant document, a completely unrelated one, a uh, distracting one. Now, with the paradigm shift that I talked at the beginning that is happening, the end user is not a human anymore. It's an LLM, which seems to not be able to discern between relevant and non-relevant information. So I think that there should be more research in how to build RAC system, in particular, how to bridge, bridge the gap between retrievers and generators. So this is the last slide with the key insights. So relevant should be placed close to the query. Distracting are harmful, probably for, um, 
due to the, how attention works. And last, random documents seems to be beneficial. We don't know actually why, so I'm doing research in this. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And the last best po poster is Alessio. Hello everyone, I'm Alessio Borgi, a master's student in Sapienza, and I'm going to present this work that I've done with my professors that is titled A Multi-Reference Style and Multimodal Context Awareness, that is zero-shot style alignment, and it is for human generation. So what we propose here, we propose a novel framework that is able to generate images that has the same style, and it is zero-shot, so it is without fine-tuning. And this incorporates also the ability to have multimodal, multimodal context awareness and incorporates also the ability to be multi-reference style alignment. So as you all know, state-of-the-art solutions provide that there are the solutions for which we need fine-tuning. And of course, all the drawbacks that comes from HIT is that they are computationally expensive, require human inputs, and so on and so forth. So what, we are, what are uh, our starting points? Our starting point is to start with uh, Stable Diffusion Excel and make use of these two um, gorgeous um, implementations that has been introduced by Google Research that is called Share Attention. This is uh, applied in practice in the diffusion process and it allows the images to not only um, attend itself but also to attend the reference image. And what we have is also we make use of Adain that is used for uh, reducing the content leakage that could, could uh, arise from heat. This is an example of the typical solution. So the first line that you can see here is the basic SDXL result, while the second line is the re same result with the same input prompts uh, that we obtained. As you can see, the, um, the the, um, all the set of images that has been generated have all the same style. And um, note that um, the reference image I was referring before here, since it is not provided any reference image, is the first one to be generated. But what if we want to uh, provide an input, a reference image from which we want to take the style? Here we provide, for example, for a reference image that is medieval painting, and we would like to have all the other images to be style aligned with respect to it, and this is the result. But what, what about if we think about um, more than one style? So what we have is that we have think of it as a linear blending style or as a spherical blending style. So in this case, we are providing two different styles that are the medieval and the cubism one from Picasso. And we are also providing here some uh, weights that um, weight how much we want to take from one reference style with respect to the other. And this is the result we obtain for our linear blending style. So we, in practice, go through the diffusion process. And in the latent space, what we do is to simply uh, weight the two uh, results that we obtain once uh, for the first reference and once for the second one. This is instead the second option that we have taken into account, that is the spherical interpolation. As you can see clearly, spherical interpolation obtain way better results. This is due why. This is because the, um, during the diffusion process, we are given an unlatent representation in n dimension. And the linear problem, of course, is that uh, in, the linear, in the linear space, we have a high dimensional result that uh, lies in a manifold. And of course, the slurp, given into account that it takes the hypersphere, hypersphere surface, it will resolve this problem. Also, what we have is that in the linear uh, space, we have that um, the latent vector will be overly biased with respect to one of the latent vectors, while the slurp solution is that it maintains proportions of the features that, uh, that take into account in both cases. Um, for this case, we, have, we had to introduce new metrics. Why? Because for now, the, it is used Dynovit B8. Dynovit B8 is a self-supervised vision transformer. 
that is used for extraction and comparison. And what we have is that it excels, of course, in, in establishing how much in the image generated uh, we have the same style. But of course, what about we have multiple reference images? In this case, we needed to introduce the weighted, weighted multi-style Dynovit V8 that takes into account the, uh, also the weight that you have seen before. That takes into account uh, how much I want of this reference style in the image generated. The second part and branch that we uh, developed in this project is the fact that what about also providing not only the reference style, but also context. So I want to uh, obtain some results in the image that I'm going to be generating, but um, I don't want it to be obtained using simply a prompt. So we developed like a framework that is able to take into account not only a prompt, but also a content image, also an audio, if you want, and if you may, a content weather, and a content music. These can be merged all together, passing from middle, middle LLM spots that are blip, for example, for image to text description, uh, whisper from OpenAI for audio to text description. At the end, I will uh, concatenate, summarize, and rephrase the uh, text that we are going to obtain in such a way that I will obtain a big textual content description that is going to represent with all my model that I've uh, provided in input the result. And this is an example, providing always the reference, the reference image. And I simply went in my garden, I've taken some photos, and um, I've passed them through Blip. And simply, the result that I obtained is a description from them, and the result is, as you can see, style aligned. The same as I, I done with the, with the music and with an audio. Here we can see, for example, the multimodal example. I've also done some example with the, the weather forecasting. As in, in, the, in this example, I've provided for some Edward Monk. And in addition to the image, also the Open Weather API. So what is the feature work I'm working currently now? Very briefly is that um, actually now I'm using scale.proglet from SDXL. And as you know, it takes big O and square D, uh, D where N square is, of course, the sequence length, so the number, number of tokens that you can also imagine as the number of pixels, while this is the hidden representation dimension. Now, I'm not, uh, I have not the whole uh, result, but I'm applying the focus attention. That is one result that has been published during May in this year. And as you can see from the images, this work is, um, for me, also better, because it is linear, of course, with respect to the original one, and it's providing always the same result. So providing style alignment in the image to be generated. So thank you for all. If you have any question. Yeah, th thanks for all the, uh, the best poster authors, but also everyone that contributed to the poster sessions. <laughs>